just like any other IT technology, some may think containers are cliche at this point in time, but um, I believe we had seen um, driving or uh, landsliding shipped from normal physical hosts to um, a virtual env or virtualized environment. And in more recent times, we're beginning to see microservices and containerization coming in to take that space. And um, trust me, if you're still not doing containers or understanding what it is, you will um, soon next be like you kind of like in the stone age because this is where everything is driving towards now. Well, today's session, I will be um, Having a, this is actually a recorded, live recorded session for a presentation somewhere. And um, I believe um, both audiences that are connected to the session and also for my YouTube viewers, you love this content as well as for anyone else who's gonna see this. Um, it's gonna be in three parts. So this first part, I will do a bit of um, deep dive into understanding the technology talking about the concepts related to containerization and security, looking at security uh, in view of how to better secure containers. Then the second part, I'll be doing hands-on, the last two sessions will be hands-on demonstration. The first part, I'll be showcasing hands-on um, hacking Docker containers. Then the second part, I'll be showing privilege escalation and also escaping containers into the physical host. Well, it's going to be fun. All right, so um, now what are containers? That's the first question we see here. Um, some may think it's a buzzword at this point in time, but what are containers? Well, containerization, specifically in this context, Docker, because that's what we see most times, is a technology which allows applications. Now, this could be web, database, or even servers uh, to run abstracted from and in some isolation. Now, the whole concept is uh, virtualization tries to have isolation within the physical host where you have multiple VMs running on the physical hosts. Uh, they still, if you look at it in abstraction, you still find out that they still share the physical host resources. Now, um, for Linux environment, we understand the concept of kernel, which we'll be looking at later, and how that helps to better uh, 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 make containerization something that is more like the future of where this technology is driving towards. All right, great. So. Um, the Docker service can launch containers regardless of the underlying Linux distro. So you think, you see, we're taking away that abstraction that comes with uh, distro specific, for instance, Ubuntu, Red Hat, uh, uh, um, even a Windows environment. We're taking all that off and trying to see how we can have whatever the case may be run on whatever the case may be the host is. Now, containers can enable incredibly or incredible application density since you don't um, the whole concept is you don't have or you don't have the overhead of the full OS image uh, for each application. So just what you need to run, that's what you find happening within the container, container space. Now, the same container can run on different versions of Linux, which is very true. Example, Ubuntu containers can run on Fedora, our pan, which you find most times very lightweight, can run on CentOS or any other distro container simply uh basically what it does is simplifies the complexity hence application developers can rapidly build and deploy the whole concept of devops is where we're seeing this driving towards now now what are containers the meat busting uh, what it is and what is not containers are not a fit for every application very true you need to know that they are not virtualization again stressing on that it's completely different from the technology called virtualization you can run containers on os or even a bare metal obviously that's where the difference starts coming into the picture okay now container security is our focus for today's session uh, uh, um, and i hope that at the end of the session you should be able to grab something really cool to help better in Improve on your knowledge, going back to your workspace and applying that knowledge to better secure your infrastructure, your environment. Container security, what makes up container security? Now, this is the big um, or the boss part of this presentation. Containers use several mechanisms for security on a Linux environment or Linux space. We'll find the Linux kernel namespace, we'll find the Linux control groups or the C groups, we'll find the Docker daemon, we'll find the Linux capabilities, which we're also going to be looking at in the demonstration. I have covered each of these. Then the Linux security mechanism, like what we call the app armor or the security enhanced Linux or the SE Linux. Well, if you're not doing SE Linux as of today, I think you're still sleeping. You need to wake up. All right. So Linux kernel namespace, let's start with that. What they are and what they are not. Now, namespaces are just a way to make a global resource appear to be unique and isolated. Remember, the whole concept of containerization is 
isolation. So we want to maybe use the term trick uh, the application to feel like it has it's running in, in on its own space, independent of of any other any other application within that same space. So we find that happening here. The namespaces can help manage this. Now the namespaces that the Linux kernel can manage are we will look at the mount namespaces, the PID and the process ID, the UTS, the IPC namespace. Um, well, I don't, I'm not sure. Okay, we'll just look at it. Then the network namespaces and the user namespaces as well. Great. Now, enough with the chitty chatting. Looking at the first one, the mount namespaces. The mount namespaces allows the container to think, you remember the concept, that a directory which is actually mounted on the physical host OS is exclusively the containers. What it does is it gives the container the feel that it has its own space and it has full control of its environment. Now, when you start a container with the minus V, so we're seeing that command. Uh, let me run the Docker run something minus V container path, then maybe RO, then RW argument. You can mount a directory from the host in the container. So we can see how that works. Remember, the minus V needs to be passed in there. The container sees the directory in its own mount space. So we're more or less like creating a volume or giving, him a, giving it a virtual volume, if that's the right word to use. It sees it as though it's in its own space, not knowing that it is actually on the host. So multiple containers could, for instance, use the host via www.html directory without having to copy content. So we're taking out that abstraction uh, of them all sharing that via that, that's your web application directory without having to bother about that. Now the question is, how do mount namespaces affect security? That will be seen in the demo session. So just keep that in mind. Uh, we'll get to the demo, we'll cover that. Now, for example, look at this. I could cut the content of var .html, index of .html. So I've got this basic uh, uh, web application in the just a .html file. This is my city web application web page. Now, if I run this, I'll build this with a Docker Fedora specific image and execute a bash command to start a bash prompt. We can see how that turns out to be. Now, again, in the Docker in the container, we can obviously see the directory paths it's exactly the same as what we'll find in the normal physical hosts so in this context the container thinks it has full access of this whereas he doesn't know it that it's actually on the physical host okay now the next one we have is the pid namespaces so the pid namespaces let the container think it is a new instance. Remember, this is Linux environment, processes and process IDs. We can use identify uh, instances running on within our own environment or within the host physical host environment. When you start a container on the host, it will get a new process ID. PID namespaces enable the container to see the PID inside the container as unique. Now, in reality, that is not unique. But because of the PID namespaces, which you'll see later on as we proceed in this, even in a demo session covered extensively, we will see that that trickery comes in the picture as if the container were in its own instance of an OS, which is actually not true. In the following example, look at that. I've launched the Fedora container running bash and run the PSAX. We all know what that command does. So we will see that happening here. PSAX, we can definitely see the processes and the PID is 1.6. Now, if I go to the next slide here, we will see a difference in, well, this is the physical host, whereas this is the container. So the container thinks it actually has that uh, uh, process ID is unique to itself, not knowing that it's actually been uh, within the physical host actually, okay? Next one, we have the user namespaces. When you start a container, as you mean you've added your user to the Docker group, you start, well, um, in the demo, we will see uh, um, a flaw which helps us to escape out of a, 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 a container environment whereby the the, the uh, um, Jenkins user had been added to the Docker group and seeing how that's actually pretty much not okay from a security standpoint. Uh, uh, well, better ways to prevent or to restrict that were also covered in the demo session. So when you start a container, as you mean you've added a user to the Docker group, you start it as your user account, yes. In the following example, okay, I started container as T Cameron, just an example illustration. Once the container is started, my user inside the container is root. Obviously, we'll see that. This is an example of a namespace. Now, looking at the, um, we can see that happening in here. Once I start, currently the ID we can see is T Cameron. So if I start a container 
under this user's instance, who is actually not roots, which doesn't belong to root group, but belongs to Docker group. We can see that here. Instantly, I get a root kind of like prompt in there over. Okay, great. Now we'll be looking at the security concerns. So what are the security applications of user name spacing, which we'll be covering in the demo as well. The next one is the network name spaces. Now, uh, the network name spaces allow a container to have its own IP address. Obviously, we know the Docker environment usually have this 172, uh, 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 17, all that IP address range falling in that space. Now, so that's pretty much managed by the network name spaces, which uh, allows the container to have its own IP address independent of the physical host. Um, these IP addresses or these addresses are not available from outside the host, obviously. Uh, um, if I have to assess these IPs from the internet, it's not accessible. So you'll be seeing a bit of port mapping or port, uh, uh, um, mirroring to be able to allow that access to from an external point of view. Now the Docker service is set up as an IP table masquerading role so that the container can get the rest of the internet. So you see where that happens. Uh, uh, obviously very important. In the following query, I find that my Fedora instance has the address, okay, that even though the host doesn't have an address associated with the internet interface, obviously, if there is no uh, address on the physical host, the Docker, once Docker is installed, that creates the, the network namespaces, creates that IP address range. So a form of networking can happen within the application space or the Docker container. Okay. So we can see over here uh, on the physical host. If you look at that IP, a IP address show the IP. Uh, currently, we cannot see any IP address associated with these bots. For the Docker environment, obviously, we can see there's an IP address associated. Now, that's necessary. Uh, let's say in the environment, we've got multiple containers. There has to be from communication between them. Hence, this is very, very important or critical. Next is the, is the IPC namespace. Okay, so IPC namespace do the same thing with the inter-processes communication. Now, uh, for instance, my container has no IPC namespace map for this particular demonstration. But just to show what it looks like. If you run the command, you should be able to see if anything is mapped. I believe those who have been pretty much in a Windows environment should understand a bit much what this is. Now, on the physical host, we can see a bunch of those shared um, um, resources, both on the memory segmentation perspective. We can see all that happening here. But on the container, currently, there is nothing there. Excuse me. The next is the UTS namespace. Now, um, all these... We will be looking at security conditions or considerations for all this. Anyways, how we can better use them to uh, streamline, uh, to implement or enforce security within our containerized environments. The UTS or the Unix time sharing system namespace let the containers think it operates um, as a separate OS with its own host name and domain, obviously, uh, just for quick reference. If I look in here, currently this is the physical host, host name. We can see the physical host over there, but look at the Docker container. So it has its own host name. Now it's going to think it's a completely different OS, not knowing that it's actually just a container on an instance on a physical host. So this will be the physical host. Again, the container has its own host name. Hence, it's kind of like manages timestamp from its own perspective, thinking it's completely independent of the physical host. Next, we'll be looking at the control group or the C groups. Now, um, C groups provide a mechanism for aggregating and partitioning sets of tasks. Uh, in the demo session, we covered extensively how to use C groups to restrict the number of containers that can be spawned from a particular image. We'll see that in the demo, in the demo session, actually. So, um, this allows us to put various system resources into groups and apply limits. Now, that's the very critical importance of this or importance of this. You do not just want your containers or any user to with a privileged access to be able to spin multiple containers and exhausting the resources available on the physical host. So we can use C group to actually manage that. Uh, that could be used to manage both the CPU utilization, memory utilization, uh, the process ID is associated, also the input output. We can use the C group to effectively manage this. This ensures that even if a container is compressed or just spins out of control, there is a limit. That's the very important part of this. You set up a limit, okay? Note that when I run the command system CTL status docker service, it gets the control group and slice information just to show you what that looks like. We can see over here. We can see the memory associated. We can see the main PID. We can as well see a bit more of the C groups. 
we can see that over happening here great very important okay uh, so sc linux is enabled you do not want to disable sc linux in most of the demos we've seen sc linux is not enabled so we'll see how that actually exposes the entirety of the uh, containerized environment again you can navigate to on your physical host we covered this also in our demonstration where you find a bunch of those uh, 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 um, C groups that you can use to manage effectively. And currently on this system, we can see we just use the basic find and also piping that to what counts. Uh, we can see a ton load of them, about 8,584 of them present within this um, host. Okay, great. The next is a Docker daemon. So Docker daemon is something which I believe um, if you're familiar with containerization, you probably would have heard over and over. It's not new. It's not new anymore. The Docker daemon, uh, which usually we find in the user being Docker, is responsible for managing the control groups. So orchestrating the namespaces and, all, and quite a number of other stuff that Docker images can be run and secured. Now, we can use a Docker daemon to implement a form of security, very critical, and you should be doing that actually, because if, um, excuse me, because of the need to manage kernel function, Docker runs with root privilege. Now, uh, in the demo session, we will see how uh, spin up a Docker container and which has some form of bad configuration uh, a malicious user can actually take advantage of that and um, uh, escape the container environment they cast it runs a privilege and jumping into the physical host and owning the entirety of the host which is pretty much bad okay look out for that demo session now there are some considerations for running docker look at this very critical i'm going to stress on this only allow trusted users to run docker only in fact uh, um, what i do most times is uh, um, when those user accounts are created uh, we don't just use the basic uh, uh, linux flat file permission or user permissions we actually set up an acl uh, using the set g to manage and not just that implementing other forms of security to effectively understand what that user is like certain capabilities for that user account to ensure what they can actually do within the system space so only allow trusted users to run docker the docker documentation recommend that you add users to docker group well this is a good recommendation but again permissions are necessary remember i told you that nginx uh, uh um so, uh, sorry uh, uh, um um yeah jenkins belonging to docker group and jenkins running as a privileged user taking advantage of that to jump out of docker space or container space into the physical host pretty much bad so again uh, uh once you're implementing all this one thing which you want to have is have a monitoring plane or uh, visibility so you understand what is actually happening within your environment okay with this flexibility comes risk you can see that you can see that comes risk make sure you only delegate visibility to trusted user well even trusted users cannot be trusted i believe that's the whole essence of zero trust coming in the picture you must have a way to actually make sure you know what they are doing you monitor you're looking at you reviewing periodically okay remember that they can mount a host file system in their container with root privilege okay very critical if you're using for instance a rest api to manage your host make sure you do have a vulnerability exposed uh, you do not sorry have a vulnerability exposed because if you do uh, then it's game over obviously ensure you have strong authentication now authentication is important uh, uh, um, authorization is also critical use ssl if you are not going to expose the rest spi over http don't expose it except to secure network or vpn i believe it's better exposed via vpn or even a secure network not just out there at large believing that you have mechanisms or controls in place to manage that not a good approach actually now the linux kernel capabilities i've talked about this briefly as um as i was explaining the previous slide the root user historically had the ability to do anything obviously i was in a presentation and uh, uh, someone was saying uh, what we do is we had in the linux by deleting the root user account and I, I was like ding ding question mark question mark question mark so what happens to all the root processes and other stuff running on the linux computer okay so the root user historically had the ability to do anything once authenticated linux capabilities is a set of fine-grained control which allows services or even users in the demo session i will be showing you hands-on capability commands and how to actually restrict capabilities okay great now uh, which allows services or even users without roots equivalent to be limited to their scope let me probably break the ice i will bring up a terminal session just to show you 
um, give me a second, is it this one? I'm just trying not to expose stuff that I shouldn't be exposing to. Okay, I cannot do this now. Okay, great. I guess you find that in the uh, uh, demonstration. I can just run a basic command just to show you. Uh, maybe the cap sh, then print that out. Okay, just to show you what it looks like. So if you see this, this is my normal user cyber citrix. Oh, sorry, this is the root user. We can see a bunch of capabilities set. Now I'm going to go into the normal user context and run that command again, um, which is cap sh. Okay, we can see this user actually has got almost all the same privilege as the root user. Well, this is the only user on this box and this user actually, I, I, it belongs to the root group. So we can see how uh, bad it is from a security standpoint, but again, you want to be sure who this user is. And you also want to have other forms of security limitation or restrictions to manage what this user can actually do within the space of this Linux server. Okay, great. So that's what this whole stuff is talking about here. Uh, it allows non-root user to be granted extra privilege. Uh, so they don't have to be chasing after the admin to do specific tasks within the job role or job function. In containers, many of the capabilities to manage network and other services are not actually needed. So you want to strip them of example, SSH service, cron services, file system, them mounts completely I remove them off the user who is going to be managing that container because they don't really need that maybe the admin user on the Linux system can actually have those in case there is a need for them can come in. why do you want to SSH from a container from a docker container in fact that's the question I usually ask by default docker disallow many root capabilities including the ability to modify logs which is very critical and very important as well. Now, XC Linux, which seemed like uh, the end point or the end game of this, security enhanced Linux is a mandatory access control mechanism. Do not disable this. If you don't have it enabled, try to get it enabled on your Linux environment. Processes, files, memory, network interfaces, and so on are labeled. And there is a policy which administratively set and fixed. Now, the policy will determine how processes can actually interact with files and all the processes as well as other network resources very critical so a bit of uh, detail here SLNX is primarily concerned with labeling and type enforcement now for example this is an illustration here a service example a mythical service blah the executed file on this might have a label blah exec the startup scripts obviously will have that blah config then also the log file will have that blah log then the data will also have the blah data. Now you see how attributes are used to actually map exactly who owns this and what this can do. Now you can enforce a policy based on these attributes. Now the type enforcement is the rule set that says that when a process running in the blah underscore T context tries to access a file within that same space, yes, you can grant access. But if it's something outside that space, obviously do not allow access or deny access. So such policies will be enforced. And if a user tries to do anything outside what they've been allowed to do, obviously they do not have access, as you can see in the illustration following up here. Okay, I'm going to have to skip through this for time's sake. Um, okay, skip through this as well. I'll be glad to share the slide. Then great. Now we can see the demonstration or illustration happening over here. Great. Again, uh, you try to assess what you're not allowed to assess. You get the ding ding permission denied. Okay, great. SLNX doing a good job over there. I think that will be the end of this. But before I leave, just some tricks to help you better secure containers. Now, containers are at the end of the day just processes. You need to know that running on the host, they are just processes. Now, you should do well, one, have a process in place to update your containers. Very important. Um, run services in the containers with the least privilege, principle of least privilege is coming in place here only assign privilege when due or when needed or when necessary drop root privilege as soon as you can very necessary uh, capabilities can help you manage that mount file system from a hosted read only whenever possible very critical i, I usually find these as an exploit technique actually you find read writes pretty bad 
try roots inside the container <laughs> treat roots inside the container just like you would do on the host so you say uh, it's just written in the container but trust me within the container can actually be used to jump out of the container and get into roots on the host trust me i've actually demoed that you find in the demo as well now visibility very important watch your logs watch your logs watch your logs very critical as well okay then the don'ts don't 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 do not download outdated containers vulnerable containers except you have them within a test space now for most of the demos i had built a test environment to just to simulate or emulate what i want to show you do not run ssh in a container it's it just doesn't make sense it's stupid run with root privilege do not run but most of the demo again i'm showing with roots but do not run with root privilege and show and show you have proper access uh, control mechanism set up this do not ever disable SLNX. Don't even think about that. Do not roll your container once and never maintain them. Very bad. Do not run production containers in unsupported platform. Also very, very bad. Now, um, this is why I call it a shot. Just to let you know that containers are as important as a physical host. So if you think oh, it's just a container we can spin up and tear down, uh, trust me, whilst it's running, an attacker can actually take advantage of that to actually jump out and get into the physical host, maintain persistence. By the time you even tear it down, they're already on your physical host and it's game over for you. Okay, so this is it for today. And the second session, we'll be following up looking at the hands-on demo. The, there are two hands-on demos. The first one will be to set up an environment, run a bit of Docker uh, uh, containers, play around with permissions. Then looking at all that we've talked about. Then the second part, we'll be looking at privilege escalation and also escaping the Docker environment into the physical hosts you're gonna love that stuff all right see you soon what we'll be doing today is we'll be learning how to rapidly uh pull a docker image and then build multiple containers from within that image then seeing how we can maybe manage that on a linux system then also we'll stage a little pen test in docker environment to understand how easy it is to quickly grab your um a knowledge and do a basic paint test on a docker image we'll also be showcasing something pretty much smooth and cool which will come later on in the video showing how we can uh, manage uh, um resources associated with docker containers from a linux based system and then um, i hope you love this content please if you do like subscribe and turn on the notification button enough with the chili chali on to the business so currently on this system if i run the you can install docker by using the app to install on ubuntu which i'm running docker this will install docker we will do that then we'll just verify if there are any containers uh ps uh, we can also use docker uh image then ls currently there are no containers there are no images so quickly we'll start by docker pool alpine it's pretty small so i'm just gonna Pull that down quickly see if we're able to pull it down the latest then we will build multiple containers on that image and start playing around uh, doing some fun stuff so we can see it's pulling once it's done pulling pretty much small it's done so if I run the docker image ls we will see that we've got our pine and pull two weeks ago created two weeks ago okay this is pretty much recent one so if I run currently docker um, ps we see there are no containers so we can build containers multiple containers i think at the moment i don't i'm not sure if i probably ls in here uh looking at the um okay the docker id container id um we'll just verify that what we have in here i'm currently in this directory here so let's build some containers uh, um this is we'll be coming back to this looking at how we can use this to manage uh, um, the number of containers that can be spinned or spawned on one uh, docker image so right here if i um, maybe build one or two containers probably one for tests so i'm just going to run docker run then minus itd iteratively then we're going to pass the name of the container in this context we're just going to call it uh sorry test that's pretty much fine now that will be the container name then we'll be building this from alpine image which we have um sorry my bad i probably okay look at that s i should be typing d my bad all right great so we built our first container docker ps we can see we've got them um, the first container we can quickly 
run um, this con uh, get into this container just to test and see using the command docker exec so if i type uh, c k e r exec then we specify i should receive the container name oh sorry i should spin a shell sh so we can see id we are in the docker container this is the docker container we can see the prompt right there root prompt okay i'm going to exit this now a few things which i would love to show um whilst this is ongoing we still have a, a container right there we can see the container we can see the container id so let's come in here if we list the content in this directory we can see it's been updated with the new container which we've just created now if i go into this folder i want to show you something which is pretty much important for you linux administrators who are probably managing servers with multiple containers running images and containers we can simply go into that uh, directory just to show you in there we've got a couple of these files that we can use to manage find that fine grain access policy which we always preach about here that's what you see in there so we've seen the c group now the c group if you may be wondering probably you've never heard of what c group is before uh it's that's uh, um maybe i can say it's a linux kernel uh, uh maybe resource or something that is used to manage uh, um, resource assignment to docker images and containers on the physical host so we can use this to maybe set a basic minimum or baseline of um, resources that we associated uh, that are seeded to docker image for instance we can enforce limits and constraints around ram input output and all the resources as we can see right here currently i'm pretty much interested on the pids number of containers that can respawn from this image so if i cut the content of uh, maybe um pids uh, max what we see currently is set to max which means I can actually stage a, a form of attack that will exhaust all the resources available on this host because it's not regulated it's not controlled how many containers can be spawned from this image alpine now what i'm going to do is i'm going to remove the current container which we've created then i'm going to create another container then we will set a bit of limit on that container so we'll see how we can use that fine grain access policy to still manage uh, a number of containers that can be spawned by just passing a little bit of uh, uh, modification to the command so let's get into the business so first thing we're going to do is we're going to try to remove the container which we have just created and there are several ways that you can actually do this trust me there are lots of options that you can use to do this but i'm going to just stick to a particular option so watch this i'm going to run a docker then i'm going to pass a stop now i'm passing a stop I'm going to specify something which probably some of you be asking what is this guy trying to do here so docker ps then i'm going to maybe pass the aq flag here this will this will remove all the containers that are currently installed so running so if this executes completely we will see to check if we still have containers and you find out that there's nothing currently running and i can still run this and pass in the rm here now, like I did say, there are several ways you can do this. You can still use the Docker stop and Docker RM to do this. So if I run Docker PS, currently we see there are no, but if I run Docker um, image LS, we still have the Alpine image right there. So it's not gone. We just deleted all the containers. So let's create a container with a form of restriction. Remember, we just picked about the C group. Using that to manage the way we can actually uh, 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 um, create containers and set restrictions in them. So what I'm going to do now, I'm going to clear the screen. I'm going to create a new container of still the same Alpine image, but I will set a PID limit of maybe five or six or ten, depending on how many containers I want to respawn from that Alpine image. I'll use the command docker. Still the same technique. Run minus itd. Then we're going to specify the name. Let's still call this test one maybe just segregation kind of like then the difference now is i'll pass this pids then i will set a limit so look at that i will just do for five for now just to show you what it looks like then we're building this on the alpine image which we have alpine enter so rapidly oh great oci runtime start failure cannot start and already oh, oh okay the name uh, could that be the problem uh docker uh, ps 
okay nothing it don't work so i'm just going to go back to that command and probably change this name maybe that will solve the problem okay did so docker ps now we have the container base right there and we can see the container id uh, we can also see the images built on the top of the alpine now if i go in here and um, list the content let me go back i deleted that stuff now the new container id is 3e which is the cd 3e ls if i cut the content of pids.max you will see the limit is five now so we are beginning to manage this stuff now there are several other things we can do here we can use the c group for number of processes you can manage it as well as well as the child issues here but as we proceed we'll see how we can probably make uh, take advantage of the task and see how we can maybe set some other forms of restriction uh, within the docker containers that we're creating on an image on the physical host remember this is not set correctly an attacker can take advantage of this to make a mess of that system so the next thing we're going to do now is we're going to try to maybe stage a demo just to showcase what i'm talking about again i can run the docker exec here to get into this command this uh, container and we just the name was uh, base start a shell um sorry my bad that should be docker c k e r okay we have a shell we are in the container we can play around here and do stuff we can see this is the root of the container i'm going to exit this okay now i'm going to again delete that container so i'm going to go back to my command up there just to delete this stuff remove oh no i should run the <laughs> okay my bad sometimes it gets a bit uh a little bit too much okay i'll stop that then i'll delete it then the second part of this video we will build a vulnerable image then try to do a pen test or simulate a pen test showing how uh, maybe bad configuration we can exploit the docker container then elevate or escalate our privilege or even pivot out of the uh, a docker restriction into the physical host okay so let's remove this thing now docker ps we do not have anything there sorry man fat fingers okay great there's nothing there but again we still have our containers so let's see the second part now what we're going to do is i'll pull a vulnerable image um remember what i'm trying to show you now is seeing how we can take advantage of something called maybe a kernel namespace or namespaces uh, 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 if we do not have that proper isolation how we can take advantage of this to maybe uh, uh, exploit a vulnerable docker container and maybe even um, gain a river shell if need be the first demo will exploit a vulnerable cgi bean uh, docker container that has cgi bean vulnerable version then we'll um, probably dump the content of the password file then we're also going to try to get a callback or reverse shell on a docker container okay let's get into the business i'm going to clear the screen then i'm going to build a specific image so i'll use the command docker still on top of the alpine run uh, minus uh i'm going to remove this on the fly then i'm going to pass the it minus p i will specify the ports i'll use 8090 i think 88 is busy on my system or maybe 8070 and map that to port 80 so port 80 on the image uh port 8070 on my physical host um vulnerables i think it's called cve um that should be 2014 if i do remember 2014 uh 62 71 i think that's it let's see if we're correct and i'm going to find the image locally so it's going to try to pull it from the remote then build it on box. if it works okay it's working okay once this is done i'll come back to you guys and we'll try to see if we can exploit this image actually to so maybe first read some files on this docker image then also probably get a reverse shell into the docker image yeah great okay so as we can see we we've got this running we're going to try to see if we can maybe visit this see if we have access to browse uh, we can visit using this for server name so 172 1702 okay we're going to go check that up if we on our physical host i'll bring up a browser then open up a new page um http 
I'll paste this IP address here on port 8C70. Do we have anything running there? Mm, okay, it's not running there. What about uh, I change this over to localhost? Okay, great. So we've got this running there. We can see the CGI bin is a vulnerable kind of like one of the shell shock. So let's quickly see who can take advantage of this to start with. The first thing we're going to do, I'm going to clear the screen. Oh man, what's wrong with my fingers? My keyboard. I'm going to clear the screen, then I'm going to try to see if I can use curl as a utility to maybe read the content of a, a file in that Docker container. So what we're going to do is we're going to pass in curl. Man, oh great, I'm going to change my keyboard. I don't know what's happening to me tonight. <laughs> okay, so the user agent, the user agent, we're going to specify this uh, just empty. Then we're going to play a bit with this. Um, just walk with me uh, if you probably get lost. Let me know. I'll be glad to explain this in a private session with you. Echo, echo. Then um, we'll pass in. Uh, Bin bash, okay, that looks pretty much smooth. Then, when I see for the command, we're going to uh, cut the content in at C password. Okay, that should be pretty much okay. Then, we're going to close this up. I think we're going to try this, then run this on HTTP and the server, which is localhost on port 8070. Then we'll go navigate to the CGI bin. Uh, we saw that it is vulnerable. Boom, that's this thing on my local host. I was able to find the specific uh, command that works for this. So you can see this seems to be my local system cybersecurity user over there. So um, it means if I can find out my local host, I can actually reach the um, host which is in the Docker container. And I'm also able to drop the content of the password file. So uh, a more smooth or neat technique would be to use this to actually gain a remote shell. So let's take a netcat listener here uh, on quad five. Okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to uh, probably weaponize this thing to be able to give me a reverse shell. So I'll use the basic bash um, reverse shell. I'm just going to grab that over here from reverse shell generator which is this i'll copy this then going over here i'm going to make a bit of modification so instead of running the command to cat the etsy password i'll be running the command to actually a bash uh, to spin a bash into a uh, shell so i'm going to clean this whole stuff and i'll paste this command in here so i'm trying to spin a bash shell then use that net cat listener to catch the shell over here so currently we see if i run the command id we are in the docker container we already have access into the docker container and we can actually start uh, see we have roots right in the docker container now at this point we can start playing around uh, maybe to probably find out what is happening in here now one uh whenever i get a reverse shell like this one first command i love to run to check if i'm actually on the docker container or maybe not it's just to run the command cat um proc then i pass this over to self then I pass it over to C group. It gives me an idea if I'm actually in a Docker container. Now you'll be wondering what is all this whole stuff here kind of like doing. Uh, with time, I will be spending spending some time to explain exactly what this is doing or what you are seeing here currently because we see quite a number of information here, which might be a bit too much for some of you to take on. But keep calm, no worries. Basically, we can see we cut that content and we can see in the CPU usage, we can see a block, we can see a couple of other PIDs and stuff. This obviously looks like what you see in a Docker environment. So um, no stress, with time I'll do some good explanation for you guys. Okay, this is the first recording in the series. Now the next recording, I'll be covering two other techniques. So for these two techniques, I'll be doing privilege escalation for one. Then for the second one, I'll be doing uh, maybe abusing some form of capabilities to see if we can abuse capabilities to probably jump out of uh, the Docker environment to the physical environment. Okay, so welcome to part two of this recording series. And in this part two, what we'll be doing is uh, 
we will be trying to simulate a privilege escalation on the pivoting um, within the Docker environment. Now, the first instance of the first lab I'll be showcasing will be imagine we have a Jenkins CI, and um, um, if the Jenkins is a part of the Docker group, so we're taking advantage of the fact that Jenkins is part of Docker, Docker group, and we can see how we'll probably maybe use that as a way to escape the Docker environment uh, into the physical host. And um, I hope this works fine. So if you look right here in this directory, I have created three files. I see Docker, the Docker file. Now, if you were wondering what a Docker file is, uh, um, basically, if I'm to probably build something, we build a new image, and um, there's a Docker file like this in there. The specifications will be fetched from the Docker file to actually build the Docker image. So if I cut the content of the Docker file that I have here, you will see I'm actually building from Alpine 3.5. I copy the root of sh to sh and also copy the root shell to root shell so these that have been specified here will be taking advantage of the fact that they're already in the folder and then um, trying to build from these then also copying these out of the stocks we have in there okay so let's get this thing working and see if it's going to work out for us uh, um, basically we are emulating this uh, attacker who had compromised this docker container on the client environment and we see when the docker container so um, basically what we're trying to do is, uh, obviously this is already a root prompt, but we are trying to maybe move some stuff that we can use to jump out in there. So these three files that you've created earlier, um, stage the Python server, move them in and also compile the C program, then move the compiled part of the program in there. So right here we can see we've got all four programs in here. Basically we just need one, two, and three. Okay, great. Now I've shown the content, if I cut the content of the Docker file, um, we are specifying if we want to build fetch from this and build based on this specificity okay so that's the whole essence of having a docker file in there so now that we have all these ready and good to go let's try to see if we can build a docker image and uh, um, using the docker file which you've specified in there then maybe try to create a volume or mount a volume which we'll be using to maybe jump out of this uh, box I agree. I'm going to clear the screen just to make things look pretty much look pretty much okay for you guys. On the command Docker, I think I have to install the Docker on this box for me to be able to use it because remember it's a Docker container, so I have to install Docker on client on the Docker container. All right, so we're trying to install uh, Docker, and once this is done, we will now try to see if we can run Docker to maybe try to. I think the first thing we'll try to do is to try to build an image using all the necessary requirements we specify and if that works out fine we can now try to map a driver volume to um the physical host and see if we can use that to uh, maybe execute this c program then uh, probably if after setting permissions based on the specification here we can jump out and then um, be able to do some fun stuff i see docker is done installing let's go check around okay so we can see we have a successful build and um, basically what this has done was to um, is to use the docker file um, which we specified in this current directory to build Alpine 3.5 then we see it copies the root.sh into root.sh and also copy the root shell into root shell then we have that successfully built and also the prevex latest uh, prevex is just the name we give it so what we're going to do now we're going to probably if you look here in my local host um, i trying to emulate this thing i've created a shared directory in my temp uh, shared folder in my attempt directory. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to run a command try and do a bit of mapping So if I run the command docker, I think I want to map so I'm going to rm minus v We're going to see if we can map the temp uh, Shared which we can see right here from what I just created if we're able to map this maybe to uh, we we'll just give any random name persist is pretty much not a bad name then uh, Prevex is what we have in there. Then we, I think it's Prevex latest. I'm just going to copy this here and paste this over here. Save me some stress. So if we're able to do this map, then we'll set a binary there, which will be bin sh. If this runs successfully, it means we will have, okay, there seem to be some errors. So we're going to verify what the errors are throwing up. We'll get this fixed. We will have a mapped drive. So we're gonna we're gonna attempt this again. Basically, um, we're trying to spin up that Docker container. Then we'll see if we're able to take advantage of the fact that if we can run this, I think I probably made a mistake on my command. This should be 
run so we're going to run this and see if we run this maybe create that volume be the the map the temp shared uh, to just random and persist in docker container then we should be able to grab the privilege uh, prefix latest which we have in here the docker image then uh, once that is grabbed we will run the root.sh in there let's see if this will actually work out for us if it does work without error okay that ran pretty much smooth so no it didn't return no errors it means it successfully ran now one way to check this stuff would be to view this shared the content of this shared file we should see something in there so we see that it's got a sweet bit set we can see right the root shell for the sweet bit set now if this was not a root prompt i can simply use this to spin up a root prompt as fast as i see yes that but it's already a root prompt but just to show you uh if i run this because that's already uh a, 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 a binary which has got roots suite sets for the root users if i run this I should get a root prompt. You can see that in root prompt ID, we already have a root shell on the physical host. Now, this is one way you can go about this. Um, another way you can go about this, which we're going to be seeing, is to take advantage of uh, maybe uh, um, something like capabilities, uh, maybe the, the capsis admin and also the capsis module. If you can take advantage of those, then maybe something like uh, if that work out, works out fine for us. You can escape maybe a Docker environment again using the Docker.sock technique to jump in into a physical host. And then we're going to just try that right away in the second privilege escalation, which we'll be looking at here, uh, still in this recording. Okay. Yeah. So for our second technique, imagine we have a scenario where um, um, in the environment we've got multiple Docker containers. Then um, usually we know there's the uh, Linux socket which you can use to manage Docker containers. But we want to make one of the container to be able to actively manage other containers so we can move the socket uh, docker the sock file from our um, linux host into that docker container hence the docker container can actually perform the root privilege rights uh, just like the normal physical host will do so we want to take advantage of the fact that that had been done in this environment now you find this in most uh, uh, containerized environment trust me and then we will see if that had been done maybe we can take advantage of that to jump out from the docker container into the physical host obviously it's going to work 99.99 times percent at seeing this in environment it turns out it works pretty smooth without stress so let's see how we can replay this so you guys can probably learn how this stuff works all right so just work with me on this one so just to verify if we have this in our, on our physical host i can see it into the run I've got a bunch of stuff here, unless when it's here, then I'm going to just uh, grab for Docker. So let me see the results of Docker. So we can see there is the Docker sock over here. So um, we've got the um, sweet binary set on this as well. Uh, it's owned by Docker. So if I'm able to move this from the physical host to a container, it means that container will be able to perform the same function this physical host can perform on every containers on it now um while that may not be a good idea or a good <laughs> path to follow it does happen because sometimes you want to be able to manage other containers from a container uh, from a security perspective also that sometimes it allows for that so if we probably break into a container and we find this i think it's just game over because you can completely own the entirety of that uh physical host and all the containers on it so we're going to see how that can work out maybe we're playing that in our little lab here that works out for us well, it's came over for us actually it came over for the owner of the resources not us <laughs> so let's um replicate this uh, dumb idea kind of like so over here i'm going to create a docker container using this command then you can see that i'm actually mounting that uh, um i showed you here the docker.sock I'm mounting this right on the fly <laughs> on this Docker container that I'm creating just to emulate the whole concept of what we're trying to do. So, which means this Docker container should be able to manage or administer all of the Docker containers within the uh, uh, environment where this is installed. So let's see if this can build this image for us. If it does, then we'll have the uh, Varon Docker log file in there. Now, if this completes, the next thing which we'll do is to try and spin a shell just to simulate an attacker within the Docker environment. 
then we can now start messing up stuff or playing around with that stuff and see if we're able to exploit so we see it successfully built it so now let's go ahead with the front part of this so the first thing we're going to do is we're going to spin a shell so i'm going to run docker exec on this then i'm just going to pass the minus it then we'll specifically um call the name s o i think it's s o my bad just ignore this rubbish s o c k then let's spin a shell okay id we have a shell now let's try to verify if we have the docker run lock file in here so just ls on um the run okay seems to be in there because it seems like the file is there docker suck obviously it's in there right there so it means this has exactly what we can see here just like the physical host so what is the goods uh, or the pros and the cons of this like i did explain the pro is this docker container in a containerized environment can administer or manage all of all of that docker containers like assigning resources to them ensuring that they're running effectively or doing a bit of administration uh what the physical host will do uh what's the con of this if this is exploited then obviously again it's game over so let's see now that we have this present in here we can try to see if we can run apk updates and also apk add a user docker if that's going to allow us to do that so let's run apk updates and you may be wondering if okay, okay yeah this is actually a pine image so it's not a uh, apps <laughs> okay great so we got that run pretty much smooth now let's add a user apk we're going to run add minus u we just call this user docker so if this installed pretty much fine we should have that pretty much built then if that is done we're installing the docker clients once the docker client is installed it means we can now have a full functionality of using this uh container as a physical host with docker client installed to uh, administer docker uh, uh, probably commands maintenance management and all that stuff you'll do in a normal physical host right here on this docker container so wait for this to finish then i'll get back to you guys on this fun session all right okay so the docker client installed without hassle now let's do a game over here i'm just going to ls in here currently look at what we have in there okay great this is the docker root that I put all the files in there, but I'm going to run this command. What this command will do for me will be I'm currently look at that. I'm currently mounting the physical host <laughs> root directory into a folder called tests. Here, if this run exactly exact completely, it should be a game over for this host. Now, uh, in here I should have something called tests. I'm going to cd into tests uh, and show you the game over ls in here now look at that so this was the docker uh, root directory and all the files this is my physical host <laughs> as sad as that may sound uh every content in it let me show you that i'm going to cut the content of uh sc password okay again this is my physical host and i'm also going to cut the contents in this test we can see we've got everything in here I'm going to also try to verify this just to show you. I'm going to cut, I think I should be running the command cat uh, in tests. My badge. Because it's in tests. Okay. Great. Now this looks like my physical host stuff. All right. So we can see Cyber Citrix in there. Again, it's the complete root directory to verify that I'm going to cut the content of the shadow file just to scare you a bit this is the shadow file okay so i know some bad guys who are trying to just screen grab and see if we can go crack my fun stuff okay there's no roots there's no root patch in there go ahead with your fun okay but just to let you know that this is how bad it is when you have a docker.soc file in a container once that docker container is compromised the entirety of the infrastructure is compromised okay so you want to be sure you understand what you're doing and even if you do that you want to be sure you have appropriate security that container is absolutely effectively managed so it's not compromised for attackers to actually make a mess of your stuff so the final demo which i'll be showing before i close this session i hope it doesn't exit 20 minutes will be to escape in docker container by appeasing uh, a privileged capability so we we will imagine there's a container that had been built with privilege assigned so we'll try to see if we can probably jump out of that stuff based on the privilege that has been assigned and make a mess of it again all right let me take a
coffee break i'll be back with you guys okay okay i'm back so for the final showdown capabilities capabilities now let me show you stuff this is my physical host i'm gonna run the command cap i think it's cap sh friends we can currently see that this root user has got all these capabilities sets now um this is one way you can actually restrict or minimize or streamline what a user on the linux system can actually do so i can create a user sets only specific capabilities that i want that user to be able to do on that box as smooth as that sounds it's also some easy way to manage access rights in an analytics system so what we'll be staging today is seeing that uh, a container that has been built with privileges will be abusing those capabilities to actually jump out of the container into the physical host so the first thing the first thing we're going to do is to build a container now if you look at that the difference between this and all the other commands i've been running is that i have assigned privileged to this so which means i'm giving this guy kind of like a shotgun privilege to do stuff so i'm going to build this once this is built i will exec into it so i can actually have access into the docker container so i'm going to run the docker exec so in this we're going, going to use the exec command to get into the docker container minus it we call this privilege tests it's been a shell okay we're in the docker container great we've seen in that now what we what do we need to do from this point i will just build or install a few stuff that i would need like the lip cap and also see if that's installed correctly then we can now start verifying the privileges assigned to this docker container so i'm going to use the apk again again if you want an apk obviously this is actually our pine image add minus u so if this install i hope it does okay it's going to try to fetch it if it does fetch it it'll build it then we can we'll come back to the video to continue the record all right okay so that was pretty um fast now i'm going to just run the command to verify the capabilities on this physical but on this docker container cap sh whoa look at that <laughs> okay we've got practically everything that the physical host has and even some extra more which is pretty much bad which is pretty much bad remember we had built this as a privileged uh container so now if as a pen test or hacker if i find this then what i would love to do first is to go find a kernel exploits and use a kernel exploit module currently i do not have any kernel exploit module here, but I, so i'll be showcasing the complete part of this video you can go online and search for kernel exploits specific to alpine you find a bunch of them download them ship them into this once you ship it into this you can either stage the python server like i showed earlier to ship it in you can just use the command uh, ch mode change the permissions to execute uh, to uh, an executable once you're done with that then to install the kernel mode you can use the iron install you can use the um, i think it's not install it's ins mode my bad ins mode then specify the kernel name to install the kernel once you install the kernel trust me all you need to do is just set up a netcat listener you're going to grab yourself a reverse shell but before you install the kernel make sure you set the call back to your local host so it calls back to you before you build that kernel module and once you do that install it once you install it it is game over well I will be ending this here but again i won't end this until um, i talk about the fence so i'm going to show you guys one very good tool that comes handy if you want to defend, probably audit a docker container then better secure docker container so i'm going to go to here paste this link in here if we can load up fast uh, i don't want to exit 20 minutes okay so this is like live made easy for you you already have this stuff in here like a cs says uh, bench stuff we have the docker bench security you can just come in here depending on your physical host grab any of this stuff i'm just going to probably give this a shot i know I'm, i need to adjust a few stuff but let me just do a random like dump copy and dump and see if that stuff is even going to work for me so my physical host i can just paste this in here and try to run this you can to find the image docker docker bench security like this it's going to try to pull that from a remote then it's going to try trying to scan that stuff Okay, I may not be able to wait for you guys to finish stuff, but again, I want to stop this video here. We have been able to showcase a bunch of ways to um, 
okay it started already so now you see it's going to flag a lot of reds for me based on all the docker containers images that are installed on this host now that's one way you can audit your infrastructure which has is your containerized infrastructure find out all the misconfiguration all the flaw based on what this had picked then you can go and start fixing stuff already we can see look at that privileges not restricted for this particular privilege test container which we actually set up purposefully just to show you guys stuff again privileges not restricted for suck which was a build purposely for the test and um, there are a bunch of other fun stuff that will be happening in there it's done that was pretty fast okay i'm calling it a shot here thank you for your time please i encourage you to like our content share them and feel free to um send feedback if you've got doubt questions you want me to clear for you i'll be glad to jump on set and um, host session with you just to clear it out all right see you in the next recording have a good day and bye bye